What about uh, these countries that the United States continues to support and basically defend and allow to take vacations from history? Japan, Germany, and even the United Kingdom is cutting their defense budget. And they're all doing it because they know that American taxpayers... Sugar, sugar daddy, Uncle yeah, Sam will take care of We're the sugar daddy. What do we say to Germany and Japan? Do we support them starting to, to, to carry their own weight on, on defense spending? You know, conservatives are for tough love at home. We're for a safety net, but we're for limits to it and to say that, you know, we want to get you back on your feet, but you're going to have to take care of yourself eventually. It should be the same for the international community as well, that we want allies, we will work with allies, we'll support people when they need it, but we can't do it forever. The other thing is, is we have to realize we're not paying for this support of other countries out of surplus. We're borrowing money from China to send it to Germany. We're borrowing money from China to send it to Pakistan. Can't go on forever, and there is an end point at which the system unravels if we're not careful. Now, how do we balance the budget? Do we need to balance the budget? Should that be, would that be a goal of the Paul yep. administration? I would do it two ways. I would cut spending. I would eliminate departments. But I also would uh, lower tax rates because I think you can get growth through tax rates being lowered. And this is something Republicans have kind of given up on in Washington. All they talk about now is revenue neutral tax reform, which means half the people are going to have their taxes go up and half are going to go down and the effect on the economy would be neutral. I want to do what Reagan did, and that's dramatically lower the rates and stimulate the economy by leaving more money in the economy. It's as simple as that. But, but that does, though, cause the deficit to go up. If you don't cut spending. When, when Reagan did it, he did cut tax but he had a Democrat Congress and he wasn't able to cut spending. Right. I would do both. I would both cut spending, eliminate departments. I would not appoint <laughs> anyone to head the Department of Commerce. I would say I'm not spending the money and I'm not appointing anybody to head. And anybody I was in charge of that I could get rid of would get rid of the so, source of federal so government. So you, you, you talk about cutting spending. Let's talk about the massive explosion in entitlement programs, middle class entitlement programs. Medicare, obviously, is one of the great challenges. Uh, I think Erskine Bowles uh, says that Medicare and Medicare combined over the next 10 years will consume every dime that goes into Washington, D.C. Yeah. Uh, we, we have to reform Medicare. We have to reform Social Security, do we not? Absolutely. Two -thirds, Slow down the rate of growth? Well, two-thirds of the budget are the entitlements, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. The primary problem is an actuarial problem. There's less workers, less right. young people, and more old people. I tell people it's not my fault, it's not your fault, it's your grandparents' fault. It's too math. many damn kids. Yeah. Three people working for every one person on exactly. Social Security. Exactly. It used to be 16 to 1. Right. And so the other problem is, it's not necessarily a problem, it's a good problem, we're living longer. So really you've got life expectancy has gone up and the ratio of young to old has shifted. You have to raise the age of eligibility. If, if Social Security were raised gradually to 70, two or three months a year, over 20 years, uh, that eliminates two-thirds of the Social Security deficit. The remaining third I would means test. People like you, people like me, right. we could do with a little bit less Social Security when we retire. Right. Would you uh, support, <laughs> this is going back to my glory days, would you support abolishing the Department of Education and, and sending the money back to the states? Yes, absolutely. And God I think that's going to be a big issue again because it kind of plays in a little bit, not exactly, but into the idea of whether or not we need more federal control of curriculum and things right. like that. You're, you're against Common Core? Against, and I think, um, and what's confusing about it is I don't mind national tests. I took national yeah. tests when I was a kid. Right. We, took, we took the California Achievement Test. But our local school board and our local state decided which national test we would take. It wasn't dictated from top down. It came from the bottom up, but we still wanted to compare ourselves. So it's not the concept I'm opposed yeah. to. It's whether you have a central authority and whether it works its way down or works its way up. Is Jeb Bush conservative enough to be the Republican nominee? I seriously doubt it. I think he's going to have trouble. I think he has trouble on two fronts. One, getting the nomination and convincing conservatives that he's conservative. Right. But his second problem will be the Bush legacy on war will destroy any hope we have of getting independent vote. If you look at me in the purple states, I'm the only one that beats Hillary Clinton in Colorado, Iowa, Pennsylvania, and, yeah. and New Hampshire. And, and that leads into this final question because they're telling me we need to wrap it up. Um, talk about the book. So wh what do you say in here that would provide Republicans hope that for the first time time in maybe 20, 30 years if we nominate you. We're nominating somebody that actually can win independent and democratic votes. We talk a lot about criminal justice reform and how the war on drugs has had a disproportionate impact on African Americans. We talk about uh, trying to change the laws to make it more fair. 
there's an author by the name of Michelle Alexander, and she's written a book called Mass Incarceration, the New Jim Crow. We don't really have legalized discrimination anymore. But we have sort of a de facto uh, segregation and de facto arresting of young black men. It's got to change. In Ferguson, there are a hundred, for every hundred black women, there are only 60 black men left. The black men have been incarcerated. Some of this started under Bill Clinton. They went too far under him, and I think we ought to go back to saying, you know what, let's treat some more of the drug problems as addiction problems and as health problems and less as an incarceration problem. Boy, Willie, uh, Rand Paul, the book is taking a stand moving beyond partisan politics to unite.